We've Got Worm, a worm web serial podcast, is brought to you by Fugly Bob's Hamburgers. Fugly Bob's. Mean name, serious heart attack. And contributions by listeners like you. Hey, everybody. Welcome to We've Got Worm, a Daily Planet Films podcast series where we expertly dissect and discuss the hit web serial Worm, week by week, arc by arc. My name is Matt Freeman, your host and leader of Cell Block W of the Bauman Parahuman Containment Center. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Scott Daly, freshly delivered to me via robot arm. Scott, how's it going today? I'm doing great, Matt. And these, uh, <laughs> these, these little references to the story are getting more and more creative every week. Only got 25 left to make. <laughs> uh, but yes, as you said, in this podca- podcast, you, the expert, guide me, a first-time reader, through the ins and outs of this terrifying place as I inspect, interpret, and even speculate on what this story is and where is it is going. This week, we're covering Arc 6, Tangle. And Matt, what a, a complicated web this one weaves. That's right, Scott. Things are, are uh, getting quite tangled up in a, in a web of... Complexity and lies here. and lies, <laughs> lies, lies and and contradictions. I I you know generally I really enjoy this one a lot. Um, I mean, there's there's a couple chapters in here that I think are the best that's been done, and I know I said that last week, but um, we're we're consistently improving. I think, um, and, and that's saying something because I think we started at a pretty at a pretty high place, but. I think things are moving well. I think this arc is very well paced in how it uh, ratchets up and then uh, you know stops on the tension and eases back. Um, I just think it's it's a very well crafted arc. Yeah, yeah, and it, it leads us to a major threshold event, and I really like how that plays out. Uh, but we will get to the details of that in a bit. Yeah. For now, let's move on to discussing uh, the comments that we got la- uh, from last week's podcast. And we're going to move through these pretty quickly because we got a lot. Uh, so first on Reddit, user uh, Will, Wild, 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 Wilbo. Scott, what is that? I think it's like a, a reference to the, the new Zelda game, the Breath of the Wild. Like, wild. Oh, okay. his bow is, okay. is wild. I, I don't Us- know. Okay, well, username Wild, wild Bow. J- just kidding. It's Wild Bow. Happy birthday, Wild Bow. Happy birthday. Um, he is enjoying the podcast and we feel great about that. And uh, it seems that he has some comments for us. Um, He mentions that last week, some stuff got glossed over that he would have liked to have seen discussed. And I can only say that that's usually my fault when that happens. There are very often things that we had written down to discuss and we just sort of breeze by them and aren't able to circle back to them. But we're always trying to be better at that kind of thing. And, And we are, we are, that is our goal, really, is to to hit all these marks. Um, yeah, and I'm not going to let you take full responsibility for that. That's me too. Um, the stuff that we skipped last week, specifically, um, Taylor getting getting uh, Rachel's jacket, which was a beautiful moment of two best friends giving each other jackets because they're friends now. Um, yep. Yeah, that was written down, and and I think we just got really excited about moving on to the next part because I think this was right when Rachel's big reveal was, and we were all really excited about it. Um, so we. We missed that small but very important part, and that's yeah. uh, oops. Yeah, um, and it's going to happen again, I'm sure. But uh, just just know that that we're doing our best, and and feel free to point them out when it happens. Yeah. and we're talking to you, Wildbo. Uh, thanks again for listening, and anyone else, if you see anything that you think we missed that's big, you know, point it out. We will we will definitely make sure we bring it up uh, in the next one. Yes, that that is exactly right. We're we're totally open to that kind of commentary. Um, Wildbow brings us a trio of some really good discussion questions. Uh, the first is that he asks if Danny is a good dad or if we think Danny is a good dad. And, um, I, I guess I'll go first because I'm, I'm a father. Um, and then Scott, you can give your two cents also. Uh, so to paraphrase myself from the Reddit thread, I think being a good dad depends on more than whether your heart is in the right place, which is one sort of assumption that is something I see made on a cultural level. Being a good dad is more like a set of skills, and there's no dad school where you go to learn those skills. 
And I'm not even saying that I have those skills because I'm sure all dads think they're in the top 1% of dads, just like drivers all think they're in the top 1% of drivers. Um, but in reality, it's, um, it's, it's hard. And so Danny, you know, w when you judge him on the basis of his, uh, of like the outcome, which especially at this point in the story looks like a pretty bad outcome because his daughter has, has left home and is essentially, you know, living with criminals. Um, it looks pretty bad, but I, I'm not really ready to say he's a bad dad because he definitely was going through some extenuating times when his wife died and he just kind of shut down for a while. Uh, I guess that's my, um, I don't have a firm answer on that one. And yeah. I think you could argue it either way. I, I mostly agree with you. I think he makes bad choices, but I think he's also a human being and like, he's not perfect. He messes up. Um, I think he messes up big in this arc. Um, I think the, the way he decides to confront Taylor about everything um, lends me to believe he does not know his daughter as well as he thought he did. Um, but, uh, but that could partially be blamed on her because she has hidden so much from her father for so long. But anyway, yeah, I mean, I think his heart is in the right place. Um, he just doesn't have the skills. Um, and he wasn't, maybe he didn't get the skills because uh, maybe his wife did most of the parenting and then she died and was gone and, and he just, he wasn't ready for this. Um, so I, I kind of, I think he's kind of a bad dad, but um, kind of not. I don't. That's, yeah. I don't know if that's really an answer. It almost becomes unfair when when he's doing it all by himself. It's and it, you're judging him on a standard where most dads have a a co-parent. So. Yeah. So the next question was for you specifically, Scott. Any are there any characters that catch your eye at this stage in the story, especially uh, non Taylor, non non interlude, non main characters? So I read this question totally wrong, and I wrote down two characters who have had interludes, that's, um, that's... <laughs> um, which are which are Danny and Gregor the Snail. Um, Danny, just because uh, you know the fact that the first interlude was him, um, and there was some some still unresolved mystery going on about some of the references in that interlude. I think like this arc ends with him seemingly out of the picture. Um, but I, obviously I don't think that's going to stay that way. And I think he's going to become more integral to the story. Um, to try to answer the question on the spots correctly. Um, I'm really interested in Sundancer, um, and, and kind of what her whole thing is about. Uh, and I think that's all I can think of right now. Um, I said Gregor the snail cause I just loved him and I will always love him. <laughs> he seems really cool, but yeah, I mean, like there's so many characters and I'm really interested in, in a lot of them. Um, I think I'm trying to think there's so many names and they're going through all my head at the same time. Yeah. Um, I wish I had prepared properly for this one, but oh, uh, that's, uh, that's okay. I, I wanted to mention that, that especially this time through, I'm appreciating how like interesting the travelers seem because they're, they're just super mysterious. You don't know where they're from. You don't know yeah. why they're here. We only, we, we find out this small smidgen of information about them in this chapter. Um, we know that they're all like unusually strong apparently. Um, and I, I should mention that the reason I'm reading Worm, or the reason I read Worm, is is it, it had been recommended to me by a few different things, and my brother finally said something along the lines of like, "Yeah, there's this really this really cool part in there. These, these characters called the Travelers, and it's just, oh man, it's just so cool." And so so he gave me like no information other than the fact that there were characters <laughs> called the, called the Travelers, and it was like when Homer Simpson sees the Clown College billboard, and I was like. I'm not going to read this story. And then like, just kept thinking about like, what is the travelers? What could that be? And so I had to read the story just to find out what the travelers were. So <laughs> it sounds like the perfect Daniel obscure comment. That's, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, hopefully we'll have him on as our, as, as a guest, cause he's my worm father and your worm grandfather. <laughs> Thanks grandpa. <laughs> um, the next question was that, uh, while Bo wants to know if we think Taylor sounds like a teenager, what do you think, Scott? I, I think absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, I think a lot of times if you set out to sit down and write a teenager, you're going to make them sound too childish. Um, I think sometimes we adults forget what being a teenager is like. So we kind of uh, over uh, infantilize them and make them sound more childish than they actually are. Um, I think Taylor sounds like an adult. Um, she sounds like an adult who's pretty smart. 
uh, oftentimes rash, emotionally immature, kind of unsure of themselves, and prone to angry outbursts every once in a while. And that, to me, is what a teenager is. So, yeah, I mean, I think she, she, she talks like an adult, but she acts and makes decisions like she is still a child and is still learning the world. Um, so that's what a teenager is to me. So that's what Taylor is to me. Yeah, I think certain parts of this arc, like, like where she's in Brian's apartment, or our, our highly high, high fidelity uh, teenager oh, yeah. Mi- oh, yeah. mind uh, uh, copies. So, um, yeah, so that's that wraps up Wildbo's comments and questions. Thanks, so, Wildbo. Keep them coming. Yeah, that's right. User McMillionaire suggests that we revisit the old predictions that Scott has made just to track whether Scott still believes them, even if we don't have a definite yes or no yet. And I think that's a great idea. And we will be doing it today. So look yeah. at look for my speculations at the end of the show. Yeah. A user that I'm going to choose to pronounce as Jacobin mentions how heartbreaking it is that Taylor has been taking solace and at least being able to record all these bullying incidents um, in her notebooks and how awful it would feel and how awful it does feel as the reader to have them all dismissed out of hand. And, And I agree that's a heartbreaking moment in that chapter yeah one thing i thought of is remember at the beginning of the the story when she's talking about her superhero journal that got Mm -hmm. damaged i wonder i wonder if these kind of notes were in there or in another binder with it that also got damaged um and Mm -hmm. like it seems to me that that's that's very much a possibility um and that's maybe part of the reason why she was so distraught about this whole thing something that she couldn't even really admit to herself at the time though which is a good explanation for why we didn't know it until this moment. But um, yeah, it's really terrible. Yeah, that's, that's very plausible. Yeah. That's interesting to think about. That same user also points out that from Brutus's point of view, but yeah, point of view, Brutus himself puts Rachel's relationship to other humans in dog pack, wolf pack, social terms, which is yet another of the many clues that were given about Rachel's nature prior to the big reveal. Yeah, that was a really well hidden clue too, because it's coming from a dog's perspective. So of course a dog would think like that, right? Um, but it's absolutely true. Yeah, and and finally, um, they would like to see us comment more on the morality of things, or I guess on on our opinions on the morality of things. Like, for example, is it justified that Taylor took out Long's eyes? And um, I think that's that's interesting. It, it definitely requires some subjectivity. Like, for example, in that case, I happen to think it's absolutely justified to take out Lung's eyes there. It's just really disturbing that it occurs to her to do it, and then she does it, and that she does it coldly, remorselessly. Like, like it's not, it's not necessarily the morality of the action that's uh, remarkable, so much as the fact that she does it and just doesn't even feel anything about it, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I mostly agree with you that. I, I think I'm a little bit more horrified of the act itself than <laughs> than just her reaction to it um justified i mean that like that's tough because it makes sense rationally but yeah. it's a it's terrible and inhuman and awful um and she right. she's getting to make a decision on on what to do to this person and she's putting herself as as kind of judge jury and executioner here so um I don't know. I don't know. That's tough. But yeah, I think I think to your overall comment, I think we can do a better job. I think we do a very good job of setting up uh, what what Taylor's perspective on this particular thing is, but maybe inputting our opinions and emotions more would be good. So we'll make sure we do that. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, Another example, like I would say her taking hostages at the bank robbery is worse morally than, you know, disabling lung here because lung is a horrible person and was trying to kill her whereas you know i don't know yeah you, you yeah, get into it you I, get I think, into a lot I, of these things yeah i think you're right there but yeah we can we'll just make sure we do that you know going forward yeah foxtail lavender would like to see us speculate about trigger events for major characters uh and we can try that that sounds fun although i'll i'll have to keep my mouth shut in certain circumstances um but but scott can totally anytime you feel like uh speculating about trigger events what what caused certain powers that that would be yeah that would i be mean fun thing to do. I, I can do that i think i'd probably like to see a couple more of them explained before i start doing that just to make sure i really got a handle on uh on what they look like but yeah i think that'd be a fun fun little game to play okay sure uh she also thinks uh if it came down to a complete free-for-all at uh somers rock 
then probably Hook Wolf and Purity would survive. And that was actually my thought as well at the time. I just didn't want to say it then. Um, and my, the reasoning is that they're both really durable. Uh, and obviously Genesis would make it out because in this chapter we find out that Genesis is a projection and Trickster might make it out if he's quick enough. Yeah, I, I didn't know enough about some of these people's powers and still don't know enough about other uh, other ones. So I can't comment on this, but I will take your word for it, Foxtail. Yeah. Uh, Green Door 65 offers more love for Coil's mercs, and uh, we get to see some more normal human action this week from the PRT. So we're excited about that. But not as impressive as the mercenaries. <laughs> no, no, they're not. I'm Very Bad at Math points out something I really like thematically that in so many circumstances, you have really awful conflicts between parties who have exactly the same goal, but are going about it in self-serving ways and thus getting in each other's way. Like last week, getting rid of the ABB, everyone wanted to do it, but they were constantly backstabbing each other and, and maneuvering against each other while doing it. Yeah, that's a good uh, point, too. Yeah, there's two different yeah. types of conflict, right? There's conflict where two sides have uh, mutually exclusive goals, and then there's ones where they have the same goal and different ways of doing it. Yeah. Or they're just or they're just jockeying for for power in some greater game while they're pursuing it. Yep. So uh, related to the constantly evolving status quo situation in in this world, Predictabilicious points out how much changed in Brockton Bay simply due to the the arrival of one new bug cape and one new bomb cape and this completely upset the order of things as they were. So just imagine how how perturbed things get on a regular basis as more and more capes arrive with more and more uh, upsetting powers. Yeah, this makes me think about how maybe the status quo is not so status quo um, mm -hmm. <laughs> that um, things were not like we have Lisa's whole speech, which she actually brings up again in this this arc about um, how things all stay level and normal as long as someone doesn't cross the line. But I mean, maybe that's not exactly true that that we're seeing a constant degradation and, and the status quo is different every day. Yeah, I think that's right. On YouTube, uh, Matthias Mason, sure I'm mispronouncing that, uh, says that actually Uber's power doesn't even work the way I described it last week. So I'm not going to even try to describe Uber's power right now. I would just say if you want to know how Uber's power really works, maybe you go to the wiki or something because i no longer feel qualified to comment as an authority <laughs> I, I, i'm reading his comment right here i still don't think i get it so i hope we see him again so we can get some clarification on this yeah i mean i mean i think it's actually close to how i described it in the first place but i probably still had some details off but i'm no longer confident of that <laughs> all right so uh, as, as we move into the beat by beat summary i had a couple of uh, kind of uh, signposts that i wanted to put in, in advance as things that I want to kind of keep a, an eye on as we move forward. Um, I think the big theme for this whole arc is reputation. It comes up again and again um, in, in, a lot, in a lot of different ways. So, and I'm not going to mention all of them right here, but I, I'm going to try to mention them as they, as they crop up. And the second signpost would just be the character of Brian, because I feel like we learn a lot about Brian here and we're allowed to, we're able to put some dots together. And since this is my whatever second read through, I guess, um, I'm seeing, I'm making connections about Brian's character that I didn't make before, but they're totally visible. If you, if you pay attention to him as a, as a, as an independent character, independent from Taylor and her infatuation with him. So those are just, Ooh. We see a lot of Brian in this chapter, so that's obviously why we why we can do that here. See, sometimes Matt, you throw things at me that aren't in the script, and yeah. I get to experience them live right here. Yeah. Well. So yeah, I, that's interesting, and I am I am very interested to see how his character develops. I did like everything he did in this chapter. I, I thought it, I found it very very interesting and very um, uh, illuminating. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just he's he's a fully fleshed out character, and and we and we see more and more of him here. He's not, you know, Edward Cullen. He's not he's not there to be Taylor's infatuation target. Did you just reference Twilight? I've I've heard that that's a character in Twilight. Uh, <laughs> he's read all of them, guys. He's read all uh, of them. No, Scott's lying. <laughs> uh, okay, so moving into the beat by beat summary. 
6.1 begins, and it's been three days since the fight with Lung. We open on Skitter and an allied villain force taking out a dense nest of ABB mundane, unpowered people. Um, Taylor's just sort of owning everyone. She steals a guy's katana. Yeah, that was really weird to me because it's like she just saw something and realized it was nice and she liked it and she just took it. And yeah. like her, she doesn't even stop. There's not even a beat where she like stops and ponders the fact that she just stole something from a person. It's right. just, she's now fully in just, I take what I need. And, yeah. and, I don't and even it's an antique. It. So it's probably worth a lot too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, the villains are outnumbered 20 to one, but are still effortlessly taking down the normals. Yeah. The thing w- with this for me, like we've seen several superhero battles, right? But we, we've not really seen very much of this. Um, just superpowered people versus normal people. And it is not even close. It's not even a fight. I think Taylor specifically says they didn't even work up a sweat. So, I mean, this is just a a very, very uh, powerful illustration of how powerful these people are. Yeah. Even even the sort of weakish characters have such an advantage over normal people that it's ridiculous. Yeah. So Spitfire and Gregor are working in concert to burn down the the building after they've after they've taken everyone out in a controlled manner um there's a there's a little uh snippet um Gru is saying so this thing with the abb is almost over he said and i was talking to fog one of kaiser's people sounds like he's going to press the issue sorry sounds like he's not going to press the issue over bitch and the dog fighting thing like you suspected i nodded good i don't like them but that's a fight we don't need just yet um, I, the reason I snipped this out is that Taylor is thinking and, and speaking, you know, off the cuff. She's, she doesn't have her like mask of I am doing this for the sake of manipulating everyone and turning them over. And she's thinking in terms of yet. She's thinking in terms of that's a fight we don't need just yet. Like she's she's already anticipating having conflict with the other villain groups. And uh, I mean, I, I thought that was it was very subtle, but it's just one, one little hint at, at her mentality when she's in in her villain mode. She's kind of fully in it yeah no absolutely um she's she's most honest when she's so busy doing or thinking about something else that she she doesn't even realize her wall has gone down um Mm -hmm. and i mean we're seeing that wall like crumble uh brick by brick so it's much easier for her to not notice that it's that it's not up as as we continue um and also like you know the weird part about this that i just wanted to bring up is that she like we see her morally wrestle with like um hurting innocent people like a lot of these people she's fighting were just drafted f- forcefully uh by getting bombs put in their head to fight her and like we see her like morally wrestle with should i hit this person should i not and then Gru just solves that for her by just appearing and and punching the shit out of the guy and then right. uh and then goes on a date with her or invites her yeah. to a date right a moral quandary yeah. solved yeah she and she just stops thinking about all that stuff entirely it's totally unimportant yeah she she invites him over, uh, he invites her over to his place um to help um i guess i guess the reason he's asking her over is to help prep for aisha's caseworker to come over uh, basically it's just to build the furniture um that he needs to make his house like fleshed out basically it's because he likes her and wants to have the most sexual furniture building session I've ever seen in my entire <laughs> life, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. So, so she, she agrees um, in the middle of this like violent takedown of people. She's, they're having this, this uh, romantic interlude. Although yeah, that's so weird, right? Tonally. It's like, there's a, when she's like, I turn my attention away from, from, cuffing an unconscious girl to respond to his question about this future date right um lisa reminds us at this point uh, actually as they're leaving she reminds us about her speech about the cape community where both hero and villain come together to protect the status quo when somebody crosses the line so in this case bakara had crossed the line pretty badly with her bombing campaign and the heroes are you get the sense from tattletale at least that the heroes can even appreciate on some level that the villains are willing to operate in ways that they can't because the villains have done a lot of the work in terms of rooting out the ABB. Yeah, it's almost as if like this was so expected to happen that like someone used the knowledge of this happening before as like a way to like manipulate themselves into a power position. 
mm-hmm. something or, or, I don't, I don't or, or, or set it up maybe i don't know yeah that sounds, I, don't, that, I mean that that can't be that's it's, kind of a reach yeah too many moving parts that yeah uh, so we're just going to briefly run down some new powers that we learned about and scott you can you can as you go give me your your running commentary about uh what you think about them uh gregor the snail can make chemicals of maybe arbitrary nature and spray them out of his hands this seems really powerful um i'm sure there's a limit to it but we haven't seen it yet but that's super interesting yeah that's creative spitfire i think it's a pyrokinetic i'm not sure how much detail we get at this point about spitfire no i didn't even like it it's literally just that he sprayed i think i think it said liquid out of himself which i'm guessing was like similar to napalm but that's all we really got Yeah, I'm not, I don't even think we're supposed to know much yet. Uh, Trickster is a teleporter who can teleport anything he can see as long as he's swapping two objects of roughly equivalent mass. This would be so annoying in a fight. <laughs> it's amazing. Yes, um, you are correct. Uh, Genesis, so, you know, she's not a shapeshifter. She actually creates remotely controlled projections. Yeah, so... <laughs> Wild Poe's method of creating powers, right? It's like, mm-hmm. I'm going to think of a power that might exist in some form in some other universe, like shape-shifting. And then I'm just going to tweak it to make it like a thousand times more interesting. And that's mm-hmm. what this is to me. It's like, like, where does he come up with this? It's like, oh, you're a shapeshifter. No, just kidding. You have a remote-controlled, like, physical hologram thing that can actually punch people for you, but you're not there, and you can make it look like whatever you want. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. It, it is amazing to me how many unique superpowers he's come up with, um, considering how long like DC and Marvel have been around. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And finally, uh, B- Ballistic just needs to touch something to send it rocketing off at bullet speeds. And those things can be from ball bearings to cars inside, in size, um, which to me, you know, it immediately strikes you that this is another one of those almost purely lethal powers like Sundancer's. Yeah. So that's uh sounds that sounds pretty uh I I enjoy when we get to see that in action near the end mm-hmm. of the the arc. It it yeah. sounds cool and then in action it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um so on the way Taylor calls her dad to stay over at Lisa's again, but this time he's not immediately cool with it and he asks her to come home and he asks her outright if she's going to school and she lies. Uh oh, we uh, we talked about this though, um, in in an answering Wildbo's question, um, but this is to me an example of Danny not being a good dad. Um, he he really kind of lets her manipulate her, him here, and like, like he I think like he switches to when she lies about school, he just says something like, oh, "I suppose that's better than nothing." And kind of gives up when he's trying to command her here and be her father, but he just doesn't do it. Yeah, at, at this point, he, he, he's been thinking that he needs to give her space, but he's given her way too much space now to the point that it's really easy for her to, to bail. Um, and that's she's she's too young to have as much freedom as he gives her. I think that's yeah. my opinion. Well, and we go from in, in the span of what I'm assuming is just a few weeks. I don't know what the timetable for this actually is. We go from her, like being worried about spending the night at the loft because she wasn't sure if he was going to be okay with it to her, just like just stating it as if this is what she's going to do. And his opinion on the matter really doesn't uh, weigh into it at all. Yeah. I, I believe it's been about two weeks and she's gone from, sleeping you know at home every night to it almost seems like rarely sleeping at home yeah so i just wanted to point something out as we end this arc too um the last sentence of this arc is we descended into the darkness which Mm -hmm. is just like perfect (laughs) it's like i mean it fits thematically and it fits in the scene and it's just it's just like this was the introductory chapter of the arc and it kind of show it in that one sentence you get this is what's going to happen this week. Get ready. Yeah. And then we move into 6.2. Uh, Taylor starts her morning at the hideout, and the front page headline of the news of the well newspaper or internet or whatever reads, "Villains step in," and it has a picture of, I believe it's the big 
the big ABB warehouse takedown from the previous day. And uh, I think Taylor is actually in the picture, and she notices in the pictures that there are bugs all over the place. Yeah, I really liked that you called this out. Um, I think it was a few weeks ago now um, that you said just you told me to just be thinking about uh, how she's perceived from an outside perspective. Um, and I, I've so I've kept this in my mind throughout this. So I, I really liked reading this part. Um, and it kind of fits into that uh, reputation theme you were talking about earlier. Um, she perceives her reputation as one thing where she's at least maybe conscious that it's not great right now. But because she's so much scarier and more intimidating than she thinks she is, her reputation is probably even worse than she thinks it is right now. Um, so I think that's a really cool thing. Like she has no idea how intimidating and scary she comes off as. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Like when she's going to show up at the at the party later, you've got to wonder what's going through those wards' heads who have yeah. actually had to deal with her bugs before. Yeah, and I also like how she sees this, and like one of the first things she thinks about is how she can use it to her advantage. Um, yeah. she's like she's constantly planning and and thinking and conniving, and we really haven't seen that from anyone else in the Undersiders group. Um, and I think that's something we'll see more and more is that like I think I'm going to bring this up later, but. Um, they kind of use their powers the same way each time. And she has consistently found new interesting things to do with her powers throughout every single one of these fights. Yep, exactly. And there's some more random headlines, nothing important, just like a 12 year old girl who went missing two weeks ago before the ABB crackdown started. Yada, yada. <laughs> I'm really glad I wasn't the only one who read that as if there were like warning sirens going off in my ears <laughs> telling yeah. me that this is an important thing. Cause yeah, I mean, obviously this is going to, this is going to come back in some way. Yeah, don't, don't worry about it, Scott. Okay, about I'm, not even, I'm not even worried. Yeah, forget about it. Um, so, and, and the paper also relates to her that Lung is still blind, uh, but he was retrieved by his henchmen, so he's not in captivity. And um, it, Taylor thinks at this point, oh man, was I digging myself in deeper and deeper? No. 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 Uh, so Brian texts her at this point, and she starts getting ready to head over. Um, and Lisa is kind of needling her and making fun about how it sort of seems like a date, although you can read it different ways. I mean, I mean, cause Brian never, you know, it, it, it is, I love how it's written where you can absolutely read it as Brian being romantically interested or just being a nice guy. Um, and, and so you don't like you're not you're not like yelling at taylor you're like of course he's interested in you it's like well he could just be a nice guy but um and taylor yeah. finally admits sorry go ahead no i was just saying yeah i think it's just it's kids playing at flirting and they don't actually know how to do it so it's funny that's true good point yeah and then taylor admits to the high level intuitive parahuman thinker that she's attracted to brian and lisa says that um, she's not in a relationship. Lisa is not in a relationship because her power takes the mystery out of things and that you can't get things off the ground without a healthy dose of self-delusion and lies, which I think is a wonderfully cynical, just beautiful sentiment. Yeah, um, I really like that the power has that kind of uh, drawback, you know, mm -hmm. um, because if you think having to live her life day by day, it's it's probably really frustrating um, because you know all these things about people and. Uh, most people are kind of not great at reading other people and are bad at it and you can do mm -hmm. it all the time. But also on, on the flip side, when you don't know something, um, but you're used to knowing things, that mm -hmm. must be super frustrating too. And I actually like how this kind of ties in within the story because Taylor gets out of the shower and Lisa is just like brazenly reading her texts from Brian right. because it's like she she just couldn't stand not knowing what was going on. So she just like, didn't even think about it, just grabbed her phone and started nosing through it. Um, I think that really fits her. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that, that's, that's, that's a fantastic observation. I never singled that out to, to think about, but yeah, like she's, she's the type of person who would just grab someone's phone and read their texts because she's so curious. So it's a perfect right. power for her to have. And I mean, at this point, it's it's fitting to wonder was she like this before she had her power or is she like that or or, or is she or is she that kind of person because of her power you know yeah yeah chicken or egg um what she does say i don't even think brian knows what he's feeling romantically but she does convince taylor to dress more flirtatiously i, I really i really do love moments like this um because like this is in the middle of this life or death superhero story 
we have this little romance subplot that's going on. Um, like yesterday, Taylor was beating back a gang, uh, uh, back some gang members with like a swarm of remote controlled stinging bugs. And today she's like stressed out about um, a top that shows her tummy. And it's mm-hmm. just like, like, I think it's cool that we have these two different things, but they're also like the narrative, like stress is equal of them, each of them equally important. Like it's not saying that one part of the story is more important than another part. And this is just like throwaway stuff. It's like to Taylor and to the book. Both these things are important, and I think mm-hmm. that's really cool. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's that's what we care about. We care about the character journey. Um, Taylor. So at this point in Taylor's inner monologue, her compartmentalization between her various lives and motives is so strained that she is now intermittently aware of the fact that the compartmentalization is happening. You know, so she's thinking that a relationship with Brian is a terrible idea because she's going to betray him within a month. But then she tries not to think about that because it would tip off Lisa. But then she admits to herself that this is bullshit and it's actually because she's ambivalent about turning her friends in. But then she sort of like sweeps that thought under the rug and it doesn't pursue the line of thought about how ambivalent she is about all this. Yeah, like the truth and realization is just like bulldozing down these walls between the parts of her life and her brain and, and the, the places she stored the stuff that she doesn't want to admit. And it's just like banging it down brick by brick. And we're seeing it throughout. I mean, throughout this entire arc, we're seeing these walls come down and we're seeing um, we're going to get to a point where she finally becomes aware of the lies she's been telling herself. And then, I mean, but that is one thing. Acting on that realization is much different, um, as as we will see. Yeah. In, in general, I find this to be a very realistic depiction of what it feels like on the inside to be doing this kind of prolonged exercise at, at compartmentalization, where you sort of come close to admitting things to yourself repeatedly, and it takes a really long time to actually just go through with the whole process. Yeah, I mean, like I said probably a few weeks ago that realization is not something that happens all at once and then suddenly you know something and you act accordingly for the the rest of your life that's not how it works it comes slowly and you resist it and you push it back and you I mean if you're already compartmentalizing the realization that you are compartmentalizing can easily be compartmentalized so right. um yes. yeah it just happens over and over again so yeah it takes it takes a big push for the stuff to finally come out and be accepted oh my god scott i'm gonna write that down the realization that 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 you are compartmentalizing can be compartmentalized that's (laughs) that's fantastic um okay so she makes her way via several bus transfers through boxton bay through the rougher part of town and into the presently gentrifying area where brian lives yeah apparently even in superhero stories gentrification is still a thing so yeah. that's not something that superpowers can fix. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it makes, it makes sense. It makes sense based on what we know about this, this area. Um, so, so they grab some boxes out of Brian's rented car and they head inside his apartment. <laughs> and uh, she enjoys looking at him while they work. That's not what you wrote down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I wrote down, and she fucks him with her eyes while they work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this whole passage is hilarious. Um, yeah. I watched his muscles of his shoulders <laughs> moving under the fabric of his t-shirt as he lifted two boxes out of the trunk. Like, holy shit. <laughs> this is... yeah. And then at the end, she's like, what did, what did Lisa put in my head? And um, I'm like, Taylor, <laughs> this stuff's been in your head the entire time. Right, since since the moment you saw him, in fact. Literally, literally the first moment you saw him. Yeah. So they head inside and we begin 6.3. Um, you mean it, You mean I like to call the description fuckfest chapter? Yes, yes. It's, it's the culmination. It's the climax of, uh, of all that, if you will. It's a very, uh, very fitting word, sir. Yes. The, uh, the apartment complex, Taylor describes it as sterile and empty. And she's struggling to make small talk, but finds herself incapable. Um, this is kind of just an aside, but I think it's interesting that Wildbo chose to make the protagonist for the story a frequently tongue-tied, kind of self-critical character, when he clearly can write pretty much any kind of character. I mean, certainly many of the side characters and the interlude characters are nothing like this. And for example, he uses a really quippy and verbally 
overwhelming protagonist for Twig. So so it's a choice here to use to use Taylor the way he does, and I. So I'm just kind of bringing that to conscious attention because it's easy to forget that a character being a certain way doesn't mean that the author is a certain way. Yeah, and I think it fits um, with that question he asked, does, does Taylor sound like a teenager? Like, this is, yes, this is her sounding like a teenager, like being unable to make small talk because the pretty boy that you're standing next to um, yeah. is, is just in your presence. That is a teenager thing to do. So, mm-hmm. yes. Totally. Brian's apartment is mellow, cozy, and kind of overwhelmingly neutral. There's nothing bold. The colors that are described are like gray and beige. And Taylor absorbs all this as more information about the guy she's into. Yeah, I mean, this is so this is very similar to like her tastes, right? She she says, I think she can see herself like sitting on this chair reading or whatever. And it, it, it got me thinking about how like Taylor's attraction to brian at this point has been very physical i mean we joke around about it all the time but we don't know much of him as a person besides a few things that he said um she mostly just seems to have been enjoying like his physical body his smile um everything physical about him and in this section she really starts to she really starts to description fuck his mind yeah i like that scott (laughs) And and maybe I'm reading too much into the decor here, but it's all very cozy and comfortable and, and comforting almost and kind of safe. And I will remind you that I, I'm pretty sure that Brian was against the bank robbery job and had to be talked into it. And in a little bit, we're going to see him be against something else and need to be talked into it. And... All of this information together I was talking about earlier that that we're learning more about Brian. It's like a series of dots saying that Brian is actually very cautious and um, almost averse to danger, even though he seems to be a supervillain. I mean, he is a supervillain, but it's it's a it's an interesting contradiction. And it's something that jumped into my mind in this chapter. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think this is this is an example of clever writing right that uh physical locations that furniture that decorations can give you a viewpoint into a character's personality um this is something that movies do all the time right like when you show a character's apartment on screen like the apartment says something about the character and you use that as visual shorthand but it Mm -hmm. can work in 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 writing form as well um Mm -hmm. and it's being done here yeah totally so they start assembling the the furniture together. Is this really IKEA furniture, or is it? Is it? I don't think they ever well, actually say no, IKEA. No, actually, it's alternate universe IKEA. Yeah. Um, and whenever they accidentally make physical contact, Taylor reacts viscerally. Although Brian doesn't seem to notice, but it seems to happen repeatedly, so she can't help but wonder if it's intentional. And as a guy, of course, my thought was yes, of course it's intentional, but the text is not clear on it intentionally. Yeah, well, the text isn't clear on it because Taylor's a, a 15-year-old girl who <laughs> who has no idea. Um, but, ladies and gentlemen, let me do you all a huge, huge favor. Um, incidental contact is always intentional. Uh, the person, male or female, did it on purpose, and they are thinking about it just as intently as you are, and they notice your reaction to it. So, right. that, let's just, that, yes, all of that. You never have to question it anymore. People are aware when they're touching people. That's just yeah. kind of a thing that happens. Right. It would be really unusual to not be aware that you were touching someone, I think. Yeah. But I also enjoy how this whole, like, this 50 Shades of Worm here, Matt, because they're, like, they're building this furniture, and it's, like, the most, like, like sensual thing ever. And, like, <laughs> like Wild Bo is very clearly using words here that have double entendres on them. Um, uh-huh. Like, the quote I pointed out here is, like, where Gru says, that's faster, thanks, he replied after a second. Want to grab me the nut? And I'm just like, <laughs> I was laughing all throughout this. It was so funny. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it's, it is, it's a mixture of, of funny and highly relatable to any yeah. oh, human absolutely. who has been a teenager. Yeah. Uh, Brian eventually breaks the tension a bit by pointing out how physically tense Taylor is that she's not breathing. And she manages to explain this in an embarrassing and not entirely honest way. And then he says she smells nice. (laughs) 
<laughs> Sorry, I have I have body odor. <laughs> is, yeah. her, is her excuse right? Um, yeah, Jesus. I mean, if there's any doubt in anyone's mind that these two are into each other, it should be gone now. So at this point, uh, Aisha and the caseworker Mrs. Henderson arrive super unexpectedly uh, because um, Aisha had basically messed with everyone and, and got, gotten the time messed up on purpose. Uh, yet again, Taylor does her superficial ranking mode of description, thinking that Aisha is a beautiful woman who makes herself look trashy. Yeah, she kind of a uh, description fucks her <laughs> here a little bit, too. Um, I- I'm really glad we like picked up on this so early in the story because like it makes it so much more transparent when it happens again and again that um, Taylor relates to the world and the people around her through how she describes them in her head. Um, it-, it is funny that she like compliments Aisha on her looks and then kind of just tears her down about like everything else about her, like her clothing choices, her hair choices. Like she really like rips her down after that. Um, Mm -hmm. and that to me kind of signals a bit of a change in Taylor. Um, because yes, she still does rank this person as more beautiful than her, but she's very willing to then rip her down. Um, and even with Emma, we haven't necessarily seen her do that. Like Mm -hmm. as far as physical wise, like she, she talks about how she gets mad at Emma because she looks great, but she doesn't mm-hmm. ever try to like rip her down physically. Mm-hmm. It's true. So, um, Mrs. Henderson kind of notices that Taylor looks like she should be in school and isn't, and rightly points out that her excuse about the concussion is pretty poor, but she doesn't really push it. Uh, all, although it does reflect poorly on Brian that someone who should be in school is in his apartment. Yeah, but the most interesting thing to me here is that Taylor decides to stick around. Like, everything we've seen from her previously, um, anytime there's a difficult or an awkward situation, she runs. Um, And that she's saying here is a change in her. And it's because she really wants to do Brian. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, yeah, just be part of all this, too. Yeah. So Aisha gets Taylor alone and then starts insinuating that she knows about Brian's cape life. Uh, Taylor plays dumb, and Aisha clarifies that he told her because there's a high chance of sibling getting powers, and doesn't want her to be surprised. Uh, just, I just I love the moment where uh, where Taylor puts on her best her best face and goes, "You're saying your brother's a supervillain?" Uh, just for some reason that cracks me up. Yeah, she's not too good at lying, is she? No, not um, really. So Aisha's kind of a, a dick here, right? Like, I mean, I understand she hasn't had the best upgrading, but like she treats all this as a a game. It's very much a game to her and that's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So ultimately the social worker thinks that Brian is dominating the space too much, which is a bit funny considering that Taylor was characterizing it as surprisingly bland. Yeah. If you, I don't know if you remember, like I texted you right after I read this part and was basically like the social worker is being a real dick. Like, Mm -hmm. Brian's done everything right. Like, he has all these plans. She even says something to the effect of, like, what you've done here is more than we usually hope for. But then Mm -hmm. she, like, rips him down for this. But, like, the more I thought about it, um, the more kind of fair I thought she's being. Like, we've seen very little of Aisha, but we can already see that she's kind of out of control. Like, she's changing meeting times just to screw with people. She's flaunting secrets. She's disrespecting everyone in the room. Um, So, like it's really important to the social worker that Aisha find a place that she can call her own place to get away from um, the people in her life that are affecting her negatively and turning her into someone that she's not. Yeah. And there's nothing that relates to our main character in this at all. Is there? No, nothing at all. Yeah. Yeah. Although it's similar to our main character. um, It's totally healthy for Aisha, I'm sure, that she's running away from whatever her other negative influences are to live with a (laughs) supervillain. Yeah, I mean, that's the other good point, too, is that she's kind of between a rock and a hard place here. Yeah. Um, So Brian, uh, after after, uh, the social worker eventually leaves and kind of picks up Brian's spirits at the end there and says, you know, this is actually, it's actually okay. She kind of conveys that she just wants to make sure that it's a place where Aisha can feel at home. And and then she leaves. And Brian feels nervous, obviously, that Aisha would have brought up the supervillain thing so indiscreetly. And Taylor kind of gives him a hard time about it, actually. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought up the idea of Brian being really conservative and, and safe and risk averse. Um, 
because that's a good contrast to how it seems like he deals with his family. Um, and maybe when it comes to his family, Brian has some blinders on and is a little more reckless than he would be in other situations. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's kind of what we see here. Yeah. Um, so then at this point they get a text from Lisa that shit's going down and, uh, the last inner beat in Taylor's mind is, uh, that she needs to betray the undersiders sooner rather than later because she's just enjoying all this too much. The it's, it's wall's coming down, Matt. It's coming mm -hmm. down. Can't stop yeah. the signal. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's like the the end of each of these of these chapters is sequentially more and more like her desperately trying to to patch. Like, uh, I I can still make this work. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think I think six four is where we see the turn, right? Um, and I think that's absolutely by design. And I think it's yeah. really fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, turns out once they arrive back at the hideout that they're uh, on the news that Bakura has had built a super bomb, which is on the scale of like a huge nuke. And she was captured by the wards, uh, Vista and clock locker are singled out. And it's cool that the 12 year old saved the city. I'm glad that we have the important things in the hands of the right people. And Lung was also captured. So the, the ABB capes are apparently finally out of commission. Yeah, so this is interesting, and it's like possibly an unintentional commentary on the whole status quo thing we've been talking about before. Because um, from what we've seen, we had a bad guy step over the line, and the bad guys all scramble to unite to do whatever it takes to stop them. The good guys didn't really seem to do much they kind of just let the bad guys go and then swooped in at the end and took over and finished the job and even when they swooped in at the end it was their b team it was like the teen titans like they, right. they didn't um so it's very interesting that this story about how good guys and bad guys come together to stop super bad guy isn't as um clear and true as lisa made it seem in her original argument um we're not seeing that play out exactly like that. Yeah, I mean, as far as we know, it's more like the bad guys came together and then the good guys literally made one arrest at at a at one critical juncture. Right. And as we see, the bad guys came together not because um, this person crossed an imaginary line, but really because they all just saw it as an opportunity to gain more ground and one up each other. Um, so mm -hmm. so this this idea of uh, that everything's good and fine unless X happens is seemingly more and more not true. And really things are just constantly escalating, um, which is a theme we've talked about before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think within this chapter, we'll see that just because no one's crossed the line doesn't mean that there's not gang in inter inter gang warfare between the villains. Yeah. And apparently also during this, during this time frame, the travelers have just hit an art gallery and an airport. And, um, the um, Coils, Mercenary Groups, and the Empire 88 and the Merchants are all apparently also launching a number of spring-loaded plans to grapple amongst themselves for ABB territory. Yeah, so, so literally, um, literally as soon as the, the issue at hand was taken care of, things go back to just the way they were before. Mm -hmm. um, and like almost as, as if it was planned beforehand and they just like you said spring spring loaded like it was ready to go um so yeah this this was not i mean to me this clearly says this was not just a baku to cross the line we must rally this was enemy my enemy is temporarily my friend and mm -hmm. then i can get a one-up on them yeah right it, it it makes sense that they did that they did all those things like making sure the teams were mixed before because you see how conniving they all actually are right yeah exactly so also, Lisa tells them that the boss, the mysterious boss, wants the Undersiders to attack a big protectorate fundraiser, specifically to embarrass the heroes, and that like half, or a third to half of the heroes will be there, but they won't be pre prepared, and it will make them look terrible. Um, so, so yet again, the team agrees not to do the mission, and isn't going to do the mission, and then Lisa tells them that the reward is going to be $250,000 each if they do it. 
and also more of a seat at the table with the boss, which appeals to Taylor for obvious reasons. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it seems like, and maybe this is just Taylor flexing her power, but it seems like anytime we get to this this crossroads where um, there's a dangerous mission and nobody wants to do it, and suddenly the individual things that everyone wants um, appear in front of them, and yeah. and we all change our minds, and yeah, we're going to do it. Right. Um, so as, as she's, as she's thinking through this in, in the inner monologue, Taylor justification hour, she admits to herself that betraying these guys would be like doing what Emma did to her. Also, she's already given up <laughs> community respect by going so all in on her villain behavior with all the violent things she's done. Also, the wards program sounds totally lame, just like high school. Am I right? And what if they arrest her rather than letting her join the wards? And what if the undersiders come after her for revenge? What about her dad? So it's like all these things are just occurring to her now that like, oh, <laughs> there's actually a downside to this that she's never thought about before. So that's that's the compartment that's maybe a different compartment. This is the compartment yeah. that was holding at bay the the maybe this isn't a good idea. That it's that's the funniest part is because she's still technically compartmentalizing. She's just doing it in the opposite way that she was doing it before. It's really mm-hmm. funny. Yeah, right, right. So so all this leads her to change her vote. Um, but ironically, it's it's not because she's decided to be a villain. It's because she's like, I need to get this over with. I need to find out more about the 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 boss so I can just get this over with. Um, so she still hasn't it still hasn't broken through. Yeah, so she's got and and pardon the pun here, but I think it's an intentional pun. She's she's in this middle of this tangled web of lies, right? And it's mm-hmm. why yeah. the arc is called Tangle. But it's not spe- like it's not the lies to everyone else that she's told. It's specifically the lies that she's told to herself. And as her compartmentalization starts crumbling, and as this wall starts fi- falling down, and as this web of lies starts to untangle, she's like frantically grasping for just something to hold on to. Um, and so we see her here in the midst of all this sudden realization, and she grabs onto the one thing that she feels like she can still trust, which is her original plan, which is find out who the boss is. So mm-hmm. she she grabs onto that and she holds onto it as if it's the only thing she's got going for her. Um, and and she she knows it's not really true anymore. She knows it, but it's the only thing she's got to hold on to right now. So she's just gonna do it. And that's, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what she's doing here. And it's, it's so, it's really well done, Matt. Like I can't, this is, this is really like, it's, it's so well told and well executed and it feels realistic. Like it feels like these are the thoughts that go on inside of a human being, um, how they make decisions like this. It's just, it's great. Yeah. Just, just the way she's kind of almost methodically going deeper and deeper into disorientation because she's so disoriented. She doesn't know that she's going in the wrong direction. Right, right. Um, so when asked, she gives the justification that she wants to learn more about the employer, which is technically true. Um, and then Rachel changes her vote so she doesn't look weak next to this scrawny girl. So it ends up that they are going to do this mission. And also because they're best friends. Yep. But it, I think the cool part about how this ends is they have the majority now, but Brian never technically changes his vote, right? I mean, he, I, I, I don't think so. I might be speaking wrong, but I, I think. I, I think that's right. I think he just kind of sighs and he's like, yeah. well, if I'm the only holdout, yeah. 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 And uh, we'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Hi, my name is Bob. When I was a child, people called me Fugly, but I showed them I took that name and channeled my unending rage into a successful fast food restaurant. I stuffed my food so full of delicious grease and cholesterol, and now I sit back and marvel as my enemies die slowly of heart conditions while I... So come on down to Fugly Bob's and try the Fugly Bob Challenger. Five pounds of delicious heart-stopping goodness. If you finish it, it's free. Unless, you know, you die. Fugly Bob's. Look for the part restaurant, part bar, part shack at the end of the market overlooking the beach. And now, back to the show. 
So when last we left, the Undersiders were planning on uh, actually going through with this mission to attack the art gallery and embarrass the heroes. And we arrive at the start of Chapter 6.5 with the Undersiders riding their monster dogs, uh, jumping between skyscrapers, jumping from the top of a 32-story building uh, to the top floor of the adjacent Forsberg Gallery. And I think I actually had to read this chapter several times before my brain actually bothered to render that image um, fully because but like the tall office building that I work in is like 20 stories. So a 32 story building jump would be a really cinematic thing. Like it, it's, it's, it's a really cool image. This image of the dogs, like leaping down from the roof and bouncing off of this awning and then shooting straight across the street and smashing through the glass. This would, you know, you can you almost can't help visualizing it, seeing how it would, how it would be as a, as a movie. Yeah, and they almost fall off and die, don't they? Like, there's like they they jump on the roof, and then I think one of them like holds on to the tail of one of the dogs or something. Yeah, it's like, does. Yeah, yeah. Like this was incredibly risky, um, and yeah, I mean, like it. I kind of like that we go from them making the decision to do this right into the execution of the plan. It kind of starts in media res. I think it adds a tension and a, a dramatic tone to it that I, I really like. Mm -hmm. totally oh yeah yeah i I really appreciate the immediate res yeah so they smash down through the glass into the midst of the of the party goers and and immediately taylor is able to pick out a number of the um of the heroes that are present we've got arms master miss militia assault battery velocity triumph clock blocker vista gallant shadow stalker glory girl and a prt squad this was a really dumb idea. This is what I thought at the moment. This was a really dumb idea. Yeah. I want to mention this now um, before we move on because I feel like I'm going to forget. But we don't really see action from Vista, Gallant, or Glory Girl. And I actually like this because it gives the sense that like other stuff is going on while Taylor is doing things. And that she's not perceiving everything that's happening all the time. Like... For example, we don't see what Regent is doing for a while, so maybe he's dealing with these guys. You know, it's just you don't you don't need your protagonist to actually see and be reporting on everything. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I didn't even pick up on that. I, I in my second read through, I did notice that they specifically point out Glory Girl, and we never see her fight. Um, but I didn't even catch that. That I don't even remember that Vista and, and Gallant were there actually. So yeah. that's that's a good point, and and I think it does add, you know. A realism to these battles mm-hmm. it's, it's possible that glory girl like didn't fight because she wasn't in costume but i don't know if there's well, any but, evidence for that but isn't like she's well known right like yeah right everyone knows her secret identity so that wouldn't make any sense right i don't know so at the party we also just have lots and lots of rich and powerful people and emma matt this is perfect this is so perfect Like, Taylor's in the middle of this existential crisis. She's wrestling with accepting the truth of her situation for the very first time. Um, And, and, you know, like, I was wondering, like, what was it going to take? Like, I've been thinking in between these podcasts, like, what is it going to take that's finally going to push Taylor over the edge? Um, And, and like, now, in this moment of crisis that she's doing this, the physical manifestation of all her suffering, all the bullying is standing right there. And she's hanging out with all the superheroes that Taylor thought she wanted to be like. Mm -hmm. And like that image is just perfect. And it's like, I don't think Taylor even fully realizes it at that moment, but like, this is, I mean, she's, she's already made her decision and started to act on this, but this is, this is kind of the no going back point for me. The fact that Emma was here, um, it just, here we go. Like, and it's yeah. just wonderfully done. The idea of, of putting Emma here is just wonderful. Yeah. You know, she, she's already she's already pretty biased against the heroes in, in unconsciously before this point. Like she already kind of hates Shadowstalker. Um, she right. already is super mad at Armsmaster. And this this interaction here isn't going to make things any better. And yeah, definitely seeing Emma with those guys is is not um, helping matters. Yep. So this time, uh, the dogs are carrying giant cardboard boxes that happen to be full of bugs. Is is this the first time that we see Taylor correctly prepare for a fight? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, prepare at, to the level she needs to. It, 
I mean, she's always last time we saw her put them in her armor for the first time. But yeah, this is mm-hmm. when they brought portable bug carrying. Um, also, when she sends some extra bugs Emma's way, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> I love the quote like. If a few more of the biting and singing sort, he- sort headed in Emma's direction, it wasn't due to a conscious choice on my part. Right. But, yeah, it was, because you just, like, said it. Yeah, you just <laughs> let it happen, basically, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, and obviously this is important because it's a it's a reversal of her opinion from earlier in the story where um, she was having to defend her actions to not torture her bullies with bugs to Regent and the rest of the group, um, and they didn't understand why not, and she said... Specifically, because I don't, I don't know if you said this out loud, but she said it to herself that it would be crossing a line, and now yeah. that line has been crossed. Yep, yep. And I'm sure she feels terrible about it, right? Um, <laughs> nope, nope. Um, so the undersiders, the, basically, we're now entering high, high, high-paced uh, combat. So it's going to be fairly, fairly steady clip from here on. The Undersiders first moves to take down the PRT squad using their own uh, containment foam weapons against them. Um, so, so this containment foam is a new is a new setting element, uh, and I think this might be a good time to talk about this because it's described as basically like a, a liquid, and you spray it, and it, it expands, turns into a foam, and it's it's both um, strong and uh, elastic. So once it hardens, it's it's really hard for even strong capes to get out of simply because like if you're encased in it, you can't really get leverage to bend out of it. Um, so they make it seem like it could be used even on really, really super strong capes. Although obviously um, it's more than adequate for, uh, for normal, normal strength capes like Taylor, for example. So what do you think about containment foam, Scott? So Matt, this is another exciting episode of Scott doesn't like it. Okay. Um, so I like it in this scene specifically. I think it works very well. It, it's clever in how they use it to, to retake the advantage of all these people around it. But I think this thing existing by itself has the potential to break the world. Um, because once this thing exists, why isn't it always used? Like, why doesn't each and every single superhero carry around a gun with this stuff in it? Um, if they have access to it, why would they not use it every time? Because it seems almost as powerful and effective as each of their superpowers. Um, like every member of the Protectorate should have a gun with this thing. Like Arms Master can shrink tech down, we learn. So why doesn't he have this in his halberd? Like it, it has a real, uh, very dangerous ability to completely break everything that we've established. It's too powerful to me. And we see how powerful, I mean, they take out all these people, all these super powerful people they take out very easily. So, and I'm not saying that this can't easily be uh, like twisted upon later. And I think wild is clever enough to do it. But right now in the moment, I'm like, this breaks everything. I want to know why these guys don't bring this with them everywhere they go. Yeah, I, I won't. I won't spoil anything. Obviously, um, I, I think it's. I, I see where you're coming from, especially based on how it's introduced here, and and like especially given the line that like it could. I think the I think the specific wording was even someone like Lung would have a hard time escaping from right, it. Right. Yeah. And my sense after thinking about it is, I was like, well, my like mental model of containment foam is actually that Lung would be slowed down by it but unless he was literally fully head to toe encased in it he'd be able to rip himself out of it and and so the description makes it seem like oh this is so strong it can stop even someone like long and i'm like well uh it could probably hamper him but i I mean i'm not going to argue with with the text but um yeah but wouldn't like slowing him down still be really useful like slow him down while also using your superpower on him like i I don't know I, think I mean, yeah, just... you, at, at, at a certain point, you have to get in the nitty gritty of like, well, you need a huge amount of it for someone like Lung. Um, right. And I mean, but... honestly, at the end of the day, the the reason is they don't do it because they don't do it. And that's not key to the story. And it doesn't mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. But mm-hmm. I just like I'm going to be thinking in the back of my head every time, hey, this fight would be a lot easier if you had some containment foam. Yeah. And why don't the villains just go raid the containment foam factory? <laughs> All right. Well, I I think you'll be pleasantly surprised with how things evolve, but I I think like 
how this feels at this point in time, it, that's, a, that's a totally valid reaction. Okay. Well, and that ends another episode of I Don't Like It. <laughs> All right. So next, after taking down the PRT squad with the foam, they concentrate fire on Shadowstalker, and they stop her, even though she's quite evasive. Then Assault and Battery do their combo attack. Battery has charged up her power and releases it in a burst of speed, launching herself off of Assault, who siphons some of her kinetic energy and uses it to boost himself to attack. Um, I, I just like this small moment when she appears to stumble into a table, but actually she's just like throwing herself around it so she can launch it at them as a frisbee. Yeah, I think this is probably the first instance of seeing like intentionally symbiotic powers, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think we've seen the twins giants, but those really don't like pair with each other. They're just both have the same power, but mm -hmm. uh, this is really cool and it's really creative. Like, and you'd have powers like this that synergize so well that the people just hang out and use them together. That's a really mm -hmm. clever idea. Yeah. It's like, obviously they, they've, they've named themselves in concert so that, um, you know, they're, they're a team. Right. Uh, so she's finally able to hinder battery with some foam, but then Triumph knocks her down with a sonic shockwave. Uh, at this point, the battlefield is getting dangerously covered in containment foam in a way that isn't favoring the villains, because basically if you step in the stuff, you can get stuck in it, which could be viewed as a as a major uh, deterrent to, to using it in the first place, actually. <laughs> Maybe. <I don't> <laughs> Uh, Brutus takes out Triumph before he can do too much more damage. And then Shadowstalker is able to pull herself out of the containment foam due to being able to slip into her shadow state. But Taylor buries her again, clearly angry. Just kind of bullying her a little bit. Yeah, I, I don't... I, it's... <laughs> Sometimes I just like to throw stuff out there to see what your reaction is. Oh, it's fun. Well, I mean, that's definitely something I think that's going to come up again before the end of this chapter. Uh, in, in that she explicitly characterizes almost everyone in a position of power as a bully at a certain point later. Um, I'm just mentioning that now. Yeah, we'll no, that's a that. good point. Yeah. Yeah. And then finally, Judge Dredd, I mean, Arms Master, enters the frame. Uh, he He's pretty badass. He takes out everyone's foam sprayer with his EMP and a lot of Taylor's bugs in about 10 seconds. And then Miss Melissa emerges with Regent as a hostage. And just as an aside, I, I speculate here that because Miss Militia and Arms Master are two older and much more experienced capes, that they were hanging back and they anticipated what the Undersiders would do. And they knew Regent's tactic of hanging back and sniping with his incapacitation power. So they found him first and then they just waited for the Undersiders to kind of make a, a mistake. And then they cornered them at a moment of weakness. Yeah, um, it, it's it's like extreme overconfidence, right? Like mm -hmm. they never thought, like even Arms Master says this was over before, from the moment you stepped in the room. Like they never thought they were going to lose. So yeah, they weren't participating in the battle because they didn't need to until their opportune moment hit. They just had their mm -hmm. strategy and they executed it and were never really worried about what the outcome was going to be. Yeah, but but yeah, I mean, that, that's a good point. They, they basically allowed many of the other hero capes to be taken out while they were hanging back waiting for their opportunity and once they take their opportunity now those other guys are off the field and and can't contribute that's a good point yep so we move right into 6.6 .6 and uh it looks like arms master has some psychic shields that prevent region's power from working on him and he thinks they prevent tattletale's power from working on him but of course she's not actually psychic so so they don't and we get a bit more detail on arms master from tricks uh from tattletale uh he has a knack for condensing and integrating technology and it only really works in his presence and thus his halberd has way more capability and technology packed into it than one would anticipate yeah these details are really cool and it's making me really appreciate the tinkerer power set more um and i i definitely understand how they're not just batman anymore um mm -hmm. that they they all are individual and unique and interesting and it's a really it's a really nice twist on the whole iron man superpower like you said when we, it was first introduced to us um yeah. it's definitely more powerful and more special than just i'm rich and can build robots right cool thing about arms master like even though you kind of don't like him because taylor doesn't like him you have to admit that like it's not just 
the gadgets that make him a badass. It's the fact that he's obviously trained with them and is just incredibly experienced because he's able to, you know, do really kind of athletic things and, and manipulate his halberd in a really uh, yeah. skillful way. Yeah, and we see later that, I mean, he works his ass off. I think when, mm-hmm. when Tattletale reads him later, um, mm-hmm. that he busts his ass and is always like constantly tinkering and constantly training with the stuff that he makes. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, he's dedicated, but yeah. maybe for bad reasons. Maybe so. So, yeah, Tattletail's kind of doing her thing where she picks him apart. She says the Protectorate team hates Armsmaster because he cares more about his career than about them or Brockton Bay. And he just summarily takes her out with a strike to the abdomen with his halberd thing before she can go on. Yeah, I think this is a really smart inversion of the trend that we've kind of seen over and over again in all the superhero battles that Tattletail always swoops in at the last minute and turns the tide with her power. Um, and, and while I agree that she's important throughout the rest of this battle, um, this is like a dramatic gut punch, literally, um, (laughs) that, that clearly sets, sets the, the stage for us that things are not going to go the same way for the undersiders this time. They're dealing with a different level of a hero and it's not going to be quite as easy this time around. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing to draw attention to is is the difference between the protectorate and the wards. Like, the, the protectorate specifically refers to the grown-ups, basically. Miss Militia and Arms Master are the grown-ups. They've, they've really only been fighting kids their own age up to this point. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so it's different. Um, I love Miss Militia's power, by the way, which is just weapons. Yeah, that name makes a lot of sense now. <laughs> just, yeah. I can make weapons. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, like it's fun to think about because you're like, well, what are the limitations of that? What can she what can she make? What what can she not make? Well, we don't know. Uh, the heroes convince Gru to lower his darkness, but Skidder quickly turns this to the villain's advantage, saying that Arms Master had attacked Tattletail when she was surrendering, and they manipulate Miss Militia into using a less lethal weapon. And when she disintegrates her machete, Regen attacks with his power and makes her vomit while Taylor attacks arms master with bugs and then thinking fast manages to put her body between the halberd and the floor to absorb the EM attack that he's using. Yeah. She's so quick thinking. Like we see how quick thinking she is here and she's not even really sure. Like she doesn't even realize that her suit will help insulate her until after she does it, Mm -hmm. but she just does it. Um, and that's really cool. And it's, it's like shows again how competent she is, um, which is really important. Yeah, she's basically just planning on taking the shock, so it's only just by luck that right. her suit protects her. Right. Um, so she gets away from him, and then Velocity takes her on. Uh, this is super fun power to think about, actually, because Velocity moves super fast but hits very weakly with each individual hit. And the way I think about this is essentially that he just reduces his mass but keeps everything equal physiologically. And Velocity is basically hurting her toward the window with, like, a hundred, you know, small punches uh at a very 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 high rate i love this guy matt i love him um i love this power set and i like that so far wildbow has taken the flash Mm -hmm. and fixed him because Mm -hmm. the flash is like the most broken overpowered superhero ever um basically the only way comics that have the flash in it um fix it is by having him just not do all the things he's capable of doing but right. like if he were to really fully use his full power set he could beat like every single person ever before they could move um so like the flash needs some limitations and wildbo sat down and built some i mean uh, also battery is another speedster too right yeah, um that's, and yeah and they both have different they both have limitations they're different limitations but they both are kind of neutered versions of the flash and it's cool and it's interesting. Yeah. They're both, they're both fun to think about. It's fun to think about their weaknesses and how, you know, if you had that power, you would have to, to think your way around them and, and mold your style to, uh, to taking advantage of certain things. Yeah. So Gru uses his darkness to slow down velocity a bit. And Taylor also lands some bugs on him, which adds drag. And then she pepper sprays him and nails him in the junk with her b- baton and cuffs him. Um, so I'm sure I'm sure when she turns on the Undersiders and joins the wards that he'll be happy to work with her. 
Yeah, I mean that's the whole funny part. Without the, the throughout this whole battle is now she's literally beating up the people that she's hoping will welcome her with open arms right. and say like, "Oh, you got their bad guy! Yay, come join us!" Yeah, um, I do. I do like the pepper spray moment though because I mean it's so funny. Like Taylor is still a teenage girl and she's saved by Mace, <laughs> and it's just yeah. like it's just like all the super powered stuffs happening and. And she's saved by Mace, and then she kicks him in the nuts, like from a defense class or something. Right. Um, it's just, it's just perfect. Yeah, yeah. So Rachel grew, and three dogs, meanwhile, have cornered, surrounded Arms Master. But Arms Master still kind of trounces them because his his halberd is just endlessly full of surprises. And the, the quote is, he had a solution for every problem he'd, be, he'd been able to think of without having to worry about economy of space the weight of his hardware and the room on his utility belt or whatever. So the, the idea is this like compacting of technology power that he has really makes him super versatile and versatility in itself is a pretty big edge in this world where most people have one power and that power has a weakness. And if arms master just has a really big bag of tricks, that's, that's a pretty good advantage. Yeah. And, but I think the important part of that quote is every problem he'd been able to think of. Mm-hmm. And I think that shows, like we were talking about before, how powerful Arms Master actually is, is not just that he has this tinkering power. It's that he's intelligent and he mm-hmm. thinks through problems and he comes up with the solutions to those problems um, and he, and trains them to get to a point. Like being able to build cool tinkering stuff is great on its own, but if you don't find a way to use it in practicality, it doesn't do anything. So he's mm-hmm. he's that's why he's like one of the best in the city is that reason right there. Yeah. I mean, speaking of which, he also has that heads up display in his helmet that pipes in constant predictions about what his enemies are about to do. uh, As long as he has some video record of their fighting patterns. So like that, that by itself is a huge advantage in addition to everything else he has. Yeah. It's boarding on, on precognition there. Yeah. Through technology. It's It's cool. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, that's the cool thing about the tinker class is like it, it, it enables, the capes who have those powers to do things with technology that other capes need a power to do. And, uh, it, you know, he's obviously one of the only tinkers we've seen, but you'll see more examples of that down the line. Uh, so, so he tries to talk down Rachel, but Rachel passes the ball to Skitter and then grew darknesses them. And then arms master hits Skitter with his grappling hook and starts reeling her in, but she hooks the chain around something so that he has to come over. And then they talk briefly and at this point, she suggests that he let them go so that later uh, when she turns them in, he can say that he let them go on purpose so that Skitter could get the <laughs> info she needed. And he says no because he thinks he already has them. Um, and it's interesting at this point that Arms Master is even entertaining the idea that she still intends to betray the team at all. Uh, is he just still trusting her from before or is he using his lie detector and... If so, does that mean that in this moment, in this context, whatever, that she still plans on turning them in? Yeah, I think it goes back to what we talked about when we first learned about his lie detector, that that lie detectors only work if you don't actually believe the things you're saying. And despite Mm. everything that Taylor's gone through in these last couple chapters, a part of her still believes or is still desperately clinging on to that belief Mm -hmm. that this is what she's going to do. Um, so I think that's probably why it, it didn't work that he got a message that she was telling the truth or at least her, her belief in the, what the truth is. Yep. So after he refuses, Taylor says a one liner, which is awesome. And then attacks him with hidden hornets that are hidden in her armor. Um, and then she just tolerates his beating, uh, until Gru snatches her up onto a dog and uh, they throw the halberd off the building and they escape. Yeah, so my once again, my film geared mind sees this moment on film and it just looks so amazing. Like I'm seeing like a, a, a medium shot, maybe a point of view of Arms Master shot um, with Taylor right in front of her, him and, and she just releases all the hornets and they speed towards the camera as she gives her badass line. Mm-hmm. Like that would look so cool. Yeah, um, yeah there's a lot of stuff in here. But I I think the the other really cool part about the end of this chapter is that like that she has used her bugs for something different again. Um, She uh, spells out messages to the rest of her team with her bugs and makes a giant arrow to let them know to come out with her. Mm -hmm. Um, And 
so once again, we're seeing Taylor discover these new things she can do with her bugs um, and figure out how to use them in different ways. And yeah. she's just very inventive. Yeah. And once again, it's not at all effortful. She's just like, maybe I can make words. Yep, I can. Right. And that's that's the weird thing is we never like we've never seen like with the exception of her seeing the swarm around her in the picture and saying, oh, maybe I can use that later. We've never seen her like practice any of these things. We mm -hmm. just see it like in full formed. I'm going to do this and look how well it works. And that, again, speaks to her inventiveness and her cleverness and her intelligence. Um, and she's really good <laughs> at what she does. Yeah. And Taylor's last thought as they're leaving is chances were good. But this was my last job as part of the undersiders. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we move into 6.7. Uh, Taylor is riding behind Gru on the dog, lamenting having too much armor between her and him. Yeah, of course, because uh, in the middle of this high tension situation, she can't help but still think about doing him. Yep. And this is very yep. this is very teenager of her. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the undersiders circle up in an alley a ways away from the gallery. Tattletail is unconscious from um Armor's Master's attack. And Skeeter uses the smelling salts that they had wished that they had at the at the back of the fight, and Regent makes fun of her for remembering. Yeah, so this is kind of back to what I was talking about before, that like a a lot of the people in this group aren't really taking this as seriously as she is. Like she listens to things, she adapts, she adjusts, um, she makes new plans and executes them. Um, then this ties back to what I was saying, you know, Regent Gru and Tattletail have kind of used their powers the same way throughout every interaction we've seen there. But Taylor's keeps getting different and, and Taylor keeps adjusting and replanning and, and making new ideas and executing them. Yeah, totally. Um, so as soon as, um, Tattletail wakes up, she kind of becomes aware that they're, that they've been followed. Arms Master has, has them at one end of the alley and Dauntless, who we haven't seen yet, is at the other. So they're hemmed in between these two heroes. Uh, so apparently Dauntless's power is that he imbues his, uh, his equipment with special effects and the effect accumulates every day. So eventually due to this accumulation that apparently isn't showing any limitations he could eventually surpass everyone in terms of raw power and he's a big hometown hero which taylor intellectually appreciates although she's never been one for the hero worship she says she other than a stint directed at alexandria when she was a kid so he's not like a tinker right like he's not making tech the, the armor isn't tech he's just his power is to just make physical stuff better yeah, I think a tinker is at least physically fiddling with stuff and building something you would recognize as technology, even if you didn't understand it, and even if the tinker couldn't necessarily explain it fully. Uh, but Dauntless is just sort of casting permanent stat buffs on his gear. And he could do it, like, on anything. I, I think so, yeah. I mean, my understanding is he he is essentially picked, like, items that he's going to just have with him all the time, and then he just buffs those every day yeah this is a really interesting power i like it a lot yeah yeah it's very it's very compelling well, one of the things i wanted to point out is they they f they focus on arms master's face here and how terrible it looks and, <laughs> and, and taylor comments on how um she controlled her hornets to not leave as much venom in each sting um so like she specifically says i told him not to squeeze the venom sack as much on each sting, so it won't inject as much venom she just wants to hurt him but not like kill him um, this is like an incredible amount of specific control she's now able to do where she has, I think she said like nine, 700 Hornets were under her thing and right. she controls each of the 700 Hornets, making sure they don't over, over squeeze their venom stacks. I mean, that's right. hugely impressive. Yeah. Right. It's it, just similar to telling them to spell out words on the wall. It's like, she, I, I don't, you don't know how much actual thought that required did she have to say like okay i want to move this one here this one here this one here okay that's that's the shape of a, an eye or was it just like a command 
on some high level. Yeah, and I think I think we're seeing that in the pros kind of too, right? Mm-hmm. I think in the first few fights, there was very much more, I directed my bugs to do this, I directed mm-hmm. my bugs to do that. There's much less of that in these battles. Like when mm-hmm. the Hornets came out, it's just she said a word and then the Hornets came out. Like mm-hmm. you don't hear her internal monologue saying her, that she's directing the bugs. It seems to just be operating on a subconscious level at this point. Yeah, yeah, she's doing things intuitively, I think. Right. So Telltale says they need to get to the garage ASAP, uh, even though the other guys say, like, hey, they're just going to follow us there because she, they do it. They start heading the garage because she obviously knows something. The dogs keep Arms Master at bay at, at one end of the alley, uh, but Dauntless uh, can shield against Gru's darkness and shoot his lance at them from afar, so they're still stuck from that end. But uh, so then Tattletail tries to taunt Dauntless, but he has them blocked off. Uh, he has earbuds in because Arms Master told him to. Um, incidentally, she says Arms Master hates him because Dauntless is going to surpass him, and Arms Master can't stand that. Uh, and then Regent disables Dauntless so they can slip past, which they do. Yeah, it's really interesting that he seemed to only tell Dauntless to put the uh, earbuds in or something because the mm-hmm. rest of his team didn't have them in. I mean, I know he wasn't worried about himself because he thought he was shielded from her stuff, but what about like Miss Militia or Velocity or anyone else? Um, it just, I guess they just decided not to. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess my interpretation of this was just that, that Donless was not like Donless probably came from somewhere else, whereas everyone else was just yeah. at the party. And they didn't yeah, have I guess, the... I guess they really didn't expect them to attack the party. Um, yeah. Yeah, he was just patrolling the city, I think they said. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So the heroes chase them to the parking garage. And then suddenly backup arrives. Arms Master gets Trickster teleported and then beat up by Trainwreck and Genesis in Octopus Crabman form. And then uh, Ballistic and Circus Blitz Dauntless, keeping him on the defensive. We get to see that uh, Ballistic attack where he basically just shoots a car at Dauntless as if it's a bullet. And uh, Circus is kind of neat, too, has what's described as a grab bag of power is like a little portable dimension where she can kind of like pull a sledgehammer out of it and then put it back in instantly and as pyrokinesis. And it's fun to think about that one, too. Yeah. So this whole action scene is really fun um, because it's like it's the moment of victory, right? Our heroes mm-hmm. were pushed into the corner. I say our heroes, our villains were pushed into the <laughs> corner um, and then saved by more super villains. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's fun. I don't have a clear view on what train wreck is, but I don't think I'm supposed to yet. So that's fine. Mm-hmm. I like circus a lot. I like, sometimes it's the little things that you like the most that like she, she beats dauntless with the, her hammer. Um, mm-hmm. But <laughs> she does it like cause she can summon stuff instantly. She doesn't bother to like rear back. <laughs> it's uh-huh. just like, she just slings down and then yeah. de summons it, resummons it again. And she doesn't have uh-huh. to pick up the weight of the thing every time. Like it's a little, like I would have never thought of that as it like, Oh, you can summon a hammer, but like using it in shortcuts like that, it's just, it's so clever. Like it's just, right. it was really funny. Yeah. I mean, you feel like you, you see the love that goes into this, that, while Bo clearly thought about this power at great length, and we just see this small, small little cross section of what it can do, um, just showing that this character has clearly thought a lot about her own power and is using it, um, yeah, in a, a in a point. thoughtful way. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's that way with all the characters, right? Like, I, I don't know how many of these characters we've seen fight we're going to see again. Uh, Mm -hmm. It it might be a lot, it might not, but like, yeah, you can tell each person's power set has been thought out thoroughly um, and executed in clever ways that only only would be thought of if someone actually sat down and said, okay, here's the power set. Let me write out a list of things that I think this person could do with these powers Um, and that level of detail and attention to even what and I'm assuming she's a minor character. I don't know, but that's that's really that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that just kind of reminds me about like the trend in a lot of other media. We kind of mentioned with the flash, how the flash has to just not do certain things. The flash that, that, you know, the flash can do in order to make this situation actually dramatic. Um, and, and it's, it's very common in, in media like this for, um, basically there's, there's like an ever escalating power hierarchy and you're like, well, clearly this character would beat this character in this situation. So, 
the fact that they don't beat this character is just the fact that the plot needs them to not beat the character and it's very yeah yeah fake fake feeling but we certainly have never seen anything like that happen at this point in the story and and i i, I never feel like that happens although scott you you're welcome to keep your eyes open for that kind of thing but i, I think that it's not that there aren't like people who are way way more powerful than other people it's just like when those people are in the same setting, the one who should win is the one that wins usually. And if, if they don't, it's because of like cleverness or, or, you know, some wild card, like tattletale being able to turn the tables on stronger people because she's using a mental power that people can't punch. Yeah. That's a good point. We've never, we've never seen like a, a true deus ex machina of uh, escape for our heroes where it's literally mm-hmm. just, we need them to get out of the situation because the plot needs them to get out of the situation. I mean, the mm-hmm. plot does need them to get out of the situation, but it is always naturally uh, created and crafted in a believable way. Yep. I, I also love the touch that Trainwreck just casually crushes and destroys the halberd that just minutes ago Armsmaster had emphasized was a huge investment of time. Yeah, and like, again my understanding of the tinker of power set is it could take him months to rebuild all this <laughs> stuff. Like, it's not just like he can just do it overnight. Like it could take him a very long time to yeah. get this thing back to what it was before. Right. Um, so I guess Talk his, about embarrassing. Yeah. I guess his special helmet didn't see that coming. <laughs> yep. And then the mysterious figure approaches and it's the mysterious boss coil. Okay, so I was wrong on my prediction, but I want to <laughs> hold off on that talk for a minute because I think okay. I want us to learn more about him and his plan first. Okay, sounds good. We move right on into 6.8 where Coyle uh, invites them all into the car with him and then they drive along and he demonstrates his power wherein all the villains flip coins which land on heads. Yeah, I like that we both um, quote unquote learn what his power is without actually grasping what his power is um Mm -hmm. we know just enough to know that it's powerful and very potentially dangerous um and that that things were probably manipulated in his favor using his power but and and even like he says specifically some things but even some things we might not have even thought of yet but um yeah did we actually learn anything yeah i i I you get the sense that you haven't learned anything in my opinion like a sequence of coin flips landing all heads could literally be sleight of hand. David Blaine is stronger than Coil, the <laughs> full extent of Coil's power. Yeah, uh, yeah. So so Coil basically, you know, this is a this is one of those info dumps that is not an info dump because I think it's really enjoyable to watch you learn you learn so much about this character here that that uh yeah yeah and it's information you've been desperate for for a while and taylor's been desperate for for a while so you're really excited to receive it yeah so coil coil admits that employing the undersiders was a gambit but that they have proven themselves he's also been secretly employing the travelers which puts their attack of that art gallery uh, at the start of the chapter in context and this is all seemingly part of the same campaign of embarrassing the heroes and uh, he wants Trickster's answer as to whether he's going to stay. And Trickster says yes, as long as he's, quote, making a good faith attempt at providing a fix. And I'm just leaving a verbal note to myself here to remember this because it's going to be important later. Mm-hmm. So then Coyle states his goal. He wants to take over the city. Uh, which he acknowledges is a cliche, but <laughs> concretely, he wants to run it as a successful principality. He wants to control both the government and the underworld, and he's made a lot of progress toward that goal already. Um, since currently, he employs the travelers, the undersiders, fault lines crew, um, and a bunch of mercenaries, and so be, he has a command of a large swath of powerful capes and unpowered individuals. He's orchestrated the takedown of the ABB, and follow that up smoothly with a series of blows against Empire 88, which is which are underway. Um, the Protectorate are on their heels, embarrassed, marginalized, and politically weakened. And this this actually is given a lot of credibility by the fact that we've seen from the Ward's point of view how bureaucratic and kind of powerless the heroes are. Um, they, their their hands are always tied by the political uh, aspect of of working for the PRT. Yeah. That's the, the that's the price you take for being a good guy, I guess. 
right? Like they, they their weapons get confiscated, you know? Yeah. No, no, no undersiders' weapons ever going to get confiscated. And uh, so he wants the undersiders to be vassals in some sense, controlling and pacifying parcels of territory for him. Yeah, so I was totally wrong about Lisa actually being the boss. But you know what? I'm actually really happy to be wrong here um, because this is so much more clever than anything that I was trying to come up with as Lisa secretly being the boss and what her plans are. Um, we talk, we talked last week. We talked probably the week before about this, uh, that this overarching theme of the ends justify the means. And, and Coyle's plan is really just the ultimate expression of that, right? It's that, mm-hmm. um, I'm going to do all these things. I'm going to commit violent, terrible acts. I'm going to hurt people, but in the end of the day, I'm going to run this place better. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, it's kind of the ultimate in fascism, which is what, you know, pe- people analyzing superhero stories from the beginning analyze them as fascist tales of a person who thinks they know what's best for the city. So they go out there outside the norms of of uh, government and society and say, I am going to establish my own government where I am in charge and... Uh, you all have to listen to me or I'm going to beat you up. Um, so that's, I mean, that's what his plan is. And, and I like this a lot. Um, obviously, yes, it has been done before, but the way it's revealed here is so clever that I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the fascism inherent in it, I think is played interestingly here because it's, we don't really know all that much about how the world works, but it, it 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 does seem pretty apparent that like fascism is is an almost inevitable consequence of having a, a very small minority of superpowered individuals yeah. especially in a world that like is increasingly unstable people are going to people are going to go to the strong man and when the strong man is literally a super strong man um <laughs> then it it becomes a very attractive option yeah absolutely so from this point, uh, after having explained his plan, Coyle asks the undersiders to name their terms for helping him. But he's clearly already put a lot of thought into this because he kind of already knows what they want. He offers Rachel resources and manpower to care for her dogs. Uh, he knows who Regent is and that he's actually some other villain from some other city under a new name and costume trying to escape his father. Uh, what a rich and full life for such a young man. <laughs> I feel like he's trying to give a hint towards something. Here. <laughs> well, what do you make of this recurring idea of uh, that powers kind of sort of run in families? Yeah, um, that kind of ties into one of my speculations for this week. Okay. So I, I want to save that. Um, right. But yeah, I find this really interesting. Um, and it kind of, I guess, makes sense for Regent um, and, and why he is the way he is and why he's kind of so immature. Um, but I, I'm very anxious to see more of his story. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess it kind of makes sense that you'd be kind of blase about powers if if you weren't the first person you knew to get powers. Yeah. So he's already got Gru in pocket with the Aisha situation that he's that he's helping, you know, smooth over. Uh, He has no clear offer prepared for Skitter and he puts the ball in her court. So she thinks about it and, and her pitch is that he has to improve the city and basically do the kind of stuff that her dad is doing. And he says that this wouldn't be a good deal because he was already going to do that because he's a, he's a proud man. And if he's going to run the city, he wants it to run well. Yeah. And I think whether Coyle knows it or not, and I, I think he does, um, in saying this, he basically gives Taylor exactly what she wants. And what she wants is sufficient justification to make the choice that we all know she's going to make. And we know that she's been heading towards for the past six arcs of this book. Um, it's really funny, um, you know, we've wound down the action of the arc now, like all the action's drawing to a close, there's no more of it, but 6-9 it becomes the culmination of everything, and it's the most tense and most crazy uh, chapter of the book so far, and that's mm-hmm. right where we're heading at the at, at this, this resting of action. Um, it, it's, I, I just love it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's not explicit here, but we're given to suspect that she would actually prefer that Coyle be in charge of everything rather than the protectorate and all the, quote, bullying power abusers who currently control things. 
Yeah, I mean, if you don't believe in authority, then the people in charge shouldn't be in, a, in charge anymore, and that's that's how she feels at this point. Right, right. It just so happens that under this scheme, she would be in charge. So. Well, that's that's awfully convenient. That's just that's just a coincidence, Scott. Um, so six point nine, we we skip. She's basically, you know, said she's agreeing to 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 go along with Coyle's plan. But she's mentally writing her letter to Miss Militia where she's going to turn in the undersiders. Yeah, I, I think it's funny that we start this chapter right off with her struggling literally to find the words to mm-hmm. say. Um, it sets the tone for exactly, you know, we, we talked about setting the tone for the arc. This sets the tone for the chapter. She literally has no words. She can't come up with the words. This is the thing that she's been planning for, what, two weeks now? Um, and she now this is the most important part of the plan and she can't think of the words to actually say right she's she's stopped up uh she she's thinking to herself about a man who she met once who had this terrible come over and he didn't have anybody to tell him how bad it looked and he can't see how bad it is for himself because he's normalized it and uh you know eventually her mom tells him in the story but the point is that it's a metaphor for slippery slopes and, and normalizing behaviors so, so that to the extent you can't see what's happening anymore. So she's she perceives what's been going on in her head. But of course, just perceiving it doesn't immediately sort it out, as we've talked about already today. Uh, so this what this really means is she needs to sit down and let all these factors percolate and play out in her head. Yeah, you know, th- there are times like this when I like turn up my nose because i'm an elitist person <laughs> at <laughs> at subtext like this which is literally just text um so, so my initial reaction when i read this story was this metaphor metaphor is a little on the nose isn't it like we're literally saying <laughs> that um <laughs> uh that that there's a slippery slope here um or the, the frog in the boiling water or whatever but then i thought about it more and i thought and it brought, brings me back to you know what we've talked about before about the difference between what Wild Bo is saying in the story and Wild Bo's voice and Taylor's voice. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so then when you think about it as this is Taylor's voice, of course this is on the nose. Um, this isn't a revelation to me. This isn't a revelation mm-hmm. to you, to the rest of the audience. We know all these things already. This is specifically a revelation for Taylor. And I think it's really important that it comes from this story from her mother. Um, because we haven't talked much about Taylor's mom, and that's just because Taylor doesn't talk about her mom very much. She's been very sparse with the amount of information she's given us, the reader. Um, but we do know that anytime someone brings it up, she has an instant emotional reaction to it. So her mom is a source of of pain, but also of extreme love. And it, it is very fitting here that in this moment when she thinks of her mom is when she finally s- finds a sense of clarity. And I think that's really well done. Yeah, I love that. I love that connection. Yeah, I mean, she's she's clearly not okay with her mom's death, but she's she's just kind of soldiering on. Yeah, yeah. So she walks into her house, and her dad is being a bit more apparently than usual. It turns out he's locked the doors, and he corrals her into the kitchen and demands that she sit because he's found out that she hasn't been going to school. And he he says that he thinks he's been too focused on being her ally and not focused enough on being her parent. And now that he's put his foot down, she immediately characterizes his behavior as bullying power abuse shit. Yeah, this is just it's it's too little too late. Um, I'm, I'm really glad Danny finally stepped up and, you know, acted like a parent. But it's Taylor's too far gone at this point. And like like we said earlier in the recording, if he had known his daughter better, he would know that trapping her and forcing this confrontation is just the exact wrong way to approach the situation right now. I mean, he he fundamentally fails here. Yeah, and this. Go ahead. It, it, it might have worked before the meeting with the uh, school administrators, I think. But but since then, she's just really, really entrenched this mentality of. Anyone, almost anyone wanting something that she doesn't want is a power of using bully. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and which is really easy for her to justify because of how victimized she has been. Um, 
yeah. He, he says, why are you so insistent on escaping? I love that we keep coming back to that word. And it's yeah. like, it was the start of her moment of realization. And now we've kind of come full circle. Yeah, this idea of escaping, um, incidentally, even here, where she would never use her power, her power is intruding on her, on her awareness is. So is there another commonality in the situations where this happens? I would say, I would say, yes, it happens when she's trapped. That's a really good point. Really good. Trapped like a, like a roach in a roach motel. Like some kind of insect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to make a complete aside about writing style here. Uh, Taylor gives, uh, sorry, Taylor's dad gives her a quote, careful look. And if you ask 10 people what this meant, you would come up with 10 different facial expressions for answers. And that's perfectly fine because careful look conveys the character state, which is what's important. And that lets you paint the imagery however it needs to work for you for the scene to work. It's much better than my dad squinted at me or something because that's that's painting the picture, but it's not telling you what you need to know to understand the dynamics of the scene. So on, on this note, Wildo is actually very sparing with describing how people are doing things and, and how they're saying things, but he lets you paint that with your implicit knowledge of the characters using techniques like this. Yeah, this is a really insightful point um, that I, I think I have been trying to put into words for a few weeks and I wasn't able to. Um, Wildbo's writing is extremely efficient. And I know it's like weird saying that considering the book is like a million and a half words long, but I just mean that like each and every moment has like a purpose to it. And sometimes mm -hmm. it has multiple purposes, but within all that purpose having like, he doesn't waste words and he doesn't spend a lot of time describing or interpreting intent for you. He lets you do that yourself. Um, and that's very efficient as far as writing goes. Yeah, that's completely true. So at this point, she doesn't want to talk to her dad. She's just sitting quietly for 15 minutes, literally just suppressing her bugs for that entire time, which tells you how agitated she is. This is probably the most emotionally agitated we've seen her, actually, because there's like this line between her dad and, and her that, that is very salient. The thought of confessing to her dad is just really, really painful. It's, in her own words, 10 times harder than facing down supervillains. So she tries to write out her confession, but then she stops after writing it, and she burns it on the stove. Yeah, and this, this, is, this is the choice moment, right? This is what we've been culminating to. Um, and and I, I compared it to like her writing down, I am a supervillain, is, is Frodo walking into Mount Doom at the end of his journey. Um, but her burning it is him at the last moment putting on the ring and finally succumbing to uh, to what we've we've kind of been hinted at coming this whole time. And mm -hmm. I think it's just it, it is it is a really it's a dramatic it's it's like the imagery is really powerful that like fire is burning this away and then the ashes are put in the sink and literally washed away. Um, it's just really powerful imagery. And it's just like it, it, it fits like everything was leading to this. It, it was all came to this moment and that decision to start writing it out, to stop and to burn it and wash it away. Yep. Yeah. I, I also love that visual depiction of, of the metaphor. So this is the moment where she realizes it internally. And I'm, I'm not going to read the whole section, but it's really not that long. There's, there's really maybe four paragraphs where she fully fully admits to herself and kind of integrates breaks down all those all those inner inner walls and i like that in her own in her own mind it's not even a big realization uh it's it's a realization that she's had before she's just had it in one compartment and not allowed it to propagate through her other facets of self it's just a smooth natural click as these disparate parts of her mind integrate a bit better and it brings her peace and she knows what she's going to do. Yeah. And, and the thing I love about this is because this is how, you know, you have a really well-written character. Um, because when making what is in my opinion, the wrong decision makes you both sad for her and happy for her at the same time. I do think mm -hmm. it was the wrong decision. I think Taylor made a bad choice here. I think it was an in inevitable choice, but I think she did make a bad choice, but I am happy that she's made it because like her living this double life, her living this compartmentalized life was slowly destroying her. 
And even if it's just fleeting, this moment of peace is like actually good for her. I'm like terrified of where it's going to lead from now. But in this moment, like she's finally made her choice and you just feel like, okay, Taylor, finally you're being honest with yourself. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's like, yeah, you're, you're happy. You're happy that she's made some kind of step of personal growth. It's just unfortunate that that was in a direction that's leading her into a dangerous path. So yeah, she's not going to leave the undersiders, but she's also not going to tell her dad about her powers. She pulls out her cell and texts somebody. We don't know who at this point. And we learn from her dad's reaction that her mom died texting while driving. So cell phones are kind of taboo in the house. Yeah, I thought this was a really cool touch um, because like she's made her decision at this point, but taking out the phone is like a, an a intentional um, moment of defiance that is the probably the biggest stab at her father because like if you pay attention to how Danny talks throughout the scene um, at the point when he sees the phone like he completely realizes he's lost and he shifts to the defensive and he's mm -hmm. on the defensive for the rest of the chapter and he's like frantically trying to do other things now like throwing out her her mom's pet nickname to her um in, in an attempt to remind her of her mother is like is definitely like a hail mary last mm -hmm. ditch effort and then he kind of um switched from confronting to her just like shutting down and internalizing and saying it's my fault i mm -hmm. did this um, and it's a total dramatic shift and it's, I think it's all hinged around that cell phone. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. He switches to saying like, Oh, I'm responsible for this. Cause I wouldn't let you skip a grade. And even though she says it's not his fault, he doesn't, he doesn't feel that. Um, yeah. And, um, she, she even says at this point that she's okay with the idea of falling out of school because there are other options. Uh, she doesn't even want to go back, even if she could. And uh, she's clearly super duper biased against the school faculty and staff. Um, so the quote here, which is it's kind of a dismal view into her, her mentality about really everything, because it applies to, to all levels of authority, is a uh, way I see it, the bullying is unavoidable, impossible to control or prevent. It's like a force of nature, a force of human nature. It's easier to handle if I think about it like that. I can't fight it, can't win. So I'll just focus on dealing with the after effects. Yeah, and I think the most important part of that quote is that it's it's by definition anti-heroic, right? Like mm -hmm. this is this is a view of the world is bad, we can't save it, might as well just get what I can to survive in it. Um so she has made her choice, but like this is the moment I think where we see this fundamental change in her character because the definition of a hero is someone who fights even if they know they can't win, who believes so strongly in their ideal that they'll give everything to preserve this ideal. And this is her declaring herself as anti-hero. Mm -hmm. And it all, it all stems from that bullying. The fact that, yes, she says bullying specifically, but she's talking about, like you said, in a, a much wider scope than just bullies at school. She's talking about her, her outlook on the entire world. Yeah, she's, she's managing to characterize things as bullying, which are really just people behaving rationally in, in many, many circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he says she doesn't have to get up and she becomes angry and says she's not giving up. She's just reprioritizing. She'll be living her life, making up for lost time. And then uh, Lisa arrives, having received her text, and Taylor pushes past her dad in a slight physical altercation and leaves, unable to look back as her dad calls after her to keep in touch. And that is heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because you don't know how to feel. Like, you don't know if you're like, Lisa, how dare you? You're You're ruining this poor girl's life. Or if you're like, Yes, Lisa, you're a good friend to come to your friend's aid. It's it's very uh, it's both right, yeah. and that's the whole complicated yeah. issue of this of Taylor's whole revelation is that it's both good and bad. Yeah. Um, it's good for her, like, but it's bad for her at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I I love that this that that we're living in this gray area where she's officially said that she's not going to try to be a hero anymore, and she's going to accept uh, this person that she's become. Um, but also that doesn't mean she's a bad person and it yeah. doesn't mean that she's not going to have emotional and uh, psychological problems going forward. 
um, and is not going to be compartmentalizing different things and is not going to be still repre- still wrestling with moral quandaries with other things like mm-hmm. that this is this is a moment of change for her but it's it's not the end by any chance for her she like she's got still got a lot of stuff she has to deal with and and it seems like she's just choosing to not deal with it Mm -hmm. yeah yeah we'll have to see yep all right so that ends taylor's portion of the story at a very very dramatic junction very sharp sharp plot turn for her character uh, but not something that we didn't see coming, I think. No. We move. We now move into interlude number six. And we, are, interlude... and we are running way late, so let's speed through this, All right. <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, so our, our interlude character, Paige, is uh, <clears throat> excuse me, strapped to a contraption that makes the Hannibal Lecter restraints look mild, despite the fact she doesn't even seem to have dangerous powers. She's in court, and she's found guilty of aggravated assault with with a pair of human ability and sexual assault with a pair of human ability, which would totally be classes of crime in this world. Despite the fact that she is a rogue and has no criminal record, she's basically just a normal person with a power who doesn't really use it. She's put in the birdcage to be made an example of. Yeah, this is really the first view that we have of like the legal ramifications of parahumans existing. And uh, naturally, as, as for the story, it's kind of fucked up um, mm-hmm. because we're seeing a legal system that really wasn't built for these kind of people and it doesn't necessarily know how to deal with them. So its natural reaction is to treat them less like less like humans. They're, they're punished harshly for crimes that scare the public but weren't necessarily worse than what normal people would do. Um, and it's, it's awful, like how she's chained up and it's just, it seems so cruel. Yeah. You can see why the protectorate has this mentality of, uh, of making sure the heroes are super duper above board because like people are so freaked out on a constant basis about this type of thing. Yeah. And I, I, I do like, like the judge mentions like that our nation uses incarceration for several reasons uh, to remove dangerous individuals from the population and um, to, to give other criminals pause before they, they commit their own crimes. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, these, these are not the only reasons that prisons exist. They're mm-hmm. called correctional facilities for a reason, because while they are meant to punish criminals, they're also meant to attempt to rehabilitate them and reform them into citizens to be reintroduced into society. A fact that this judge seems to completely ignore. Um, mm-hmm. Now, of course, in, in our real world, uh, prisons don't actually end up being that, but that was kind of the original intent and right. why it's called a correctional facility. Um, but that's completely ignored in this punishment for this this poor girl. Yeah. Would you say in some cosmic sense that Canary's sentence is because of what Taylor did in this arc, like it intentionally terrifying people? Yeah, I mean, I think the whole point of Coyle's plan to have them embarrass um, embarrass the protector was to scare the shit out of the public, right? So mm-hmm. her decision to um, to participate in that definitely is scaring people and the judge saw it as a reason to make an example of someone. Um, And I think, I think the most important thing about this for me is we're seeing these legal ramifications of doing bad things. Like immediately after our main character has made the decision to embrace the bad things, Mm -hmm. because Taylor has already done worse things than Canary has done Mm -hmm. um, already. And so if she gets caught, that's life in prison. Like they've, they've shown us now that they have very little leeway with these people An accidental attack by a person who didn't even realize they were using their powers, um, gets a life in prison. Um, mm-hmm. she's done worse, so she will get life in prison. So, mm-hmm. um, I, I like the juxtaposition here it was right after that moment. And then we're, we're with this, here's what your consequences could be. Yeah. It's definitely raising the stakes. Yeah. So Canary wakes up after the sentencing, and finds herself on a transport truck surrounded by the uh, foam that we saw earlier in the arc. Paige finds that she is uh, just so happens to be in the same transport truck as both Lung and, Bak- and uh, Bakara, and they're all heading to the birdcage together. Yeah, I like this juxtaposition a lot because we have this girl who's in the same truck with two of the most violent, evil 
characters we've seen so far in the story. Mm -hmm. So to the authority, to the law, these three people are all equal and are equally deserving of the same punishment, even though what she did is is much, much less uh, terrible. Yes, yes. Uh, it's it's you're just you just feel so bad for her this whole time. Yeah. So we learned that her power is basically an amazing singing voice, which with which she launched her singing career. But the singing also has a side effect of making people susceptible to her influence. After a concert, Canary was confronted by her ex-boyfriend who was attempting to extort money from her. And she told him to fuck himself, which under the influence of her power, he took literally and attempted to do. And this is why he is, uh, she is now going to the birdcage. Yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> we thought that the, the penalty was harsh before, and now we learn what the thing actually was that happened. And you're just like, come on. I mean, I agree yeah. she should have been punished in some way, but this is, uh, she's going to be there forever. That's yeah. what they're saying. That's, that's insane. Right. Yeah, and, and it's all just to make an example. So it's, it's literally, there's no justice here. It's yeah. just to make an example. Yeah. Uh, so Bakuda is really intent on escaping, although Lung, I think, has already resigned at this point. <clears throat> so she, she uses her power, Lung's fire, Canary's collar and face mask, and uh, an incredibly high tolerance to pain to create some kind of balmy contraption, even while covered in foam using basically her mouth, I think. Uh, Bakuda insults Lung several times in order to get him angry enough to help out. Yeah, which probably won't backfire at all. Nope, nope. Nope. So as soon as the truck stops and the doors open, Bakara flings the bomb to distract the guards while Canary sings to control them and force their release. This is a pretty great, uh, brilliant plan that would have worked if there were actually any guards, but instead there's just armored giant claws that grab them and uh, pull them into the birdcage. We meet Dragon, the best tinker in the world and creator of the birdcage, uh, the, the containment foam, and just about everything else at the, at the uh, PRT. Uh, Canary notes that Dragon's accent is Canadian, which isn't an accent heard very often anymore. But why not, Matt? What happened to Canada? Know. I don't know, Scott. <laughs> I would, wouldn't worry about it. <clears throat> Dragon rattles off their chances of escape from the birdcage, which are not too great. Uh, uh, she mentions that following Canary's trial, um, that, that sorry, that she has been following Canary's trial and doesn't agree with the decision, but she has no choice but to enforce the law regardless of her opinion. And then she sticks Dragon in a cell block run by a feminist. Sorry, she sticks Canary in a cell block run by a feminist that will protect her, and it's very far from the hole that's been opened between the male and female sides of the prison. Um, later on, Lung, we, we switch to Lung's point of view. He and he's going for a stroll into the girl side of the dormitory. We meet a few characters who we'll, we'll see later. Um, and meets up with Bakuda in her cell. And he informs her that there are four ways to make it in prison. You can join a gang. You can become someone's bitch. You can kill someone. Or you can be seen as a madman. And Lung states that he's elected to do the final two. And that killing Bakuda because she has failed him in the city and with the escape is sufficient cause uh, to satisfy this. Dramatic ending. Yes. I, I love the last line, the last couple lines. Yeah. Yeah. You want to bet? Yeah. He, he did. <laughs> That's so great. Yeah. Um, so. So we learned a little bit about the birdcage, and we can't go into it too much because we're running out of time, but that was cool. I, I like yeah. seeing it. Um, obviously, it's probably going to come into play more in the future, I'm guessing. Yeah. Right. We also learn a lot about Dragon and uh, just yeah, a bunch of uh, setting stuff, which which we'll definitely see see more of later. So Scott, let's move on to your speculations for the upcoming story. All right. So because we are so far behind, I was going to plan to go through some of my old ones and update them. Um, I don't think we have time to do that tonight. We will make sure we get that in next week though but i just wanted i have a couple more i wanted to drop on you um one of them is i now think i'm almost 100 percent sure that one of taylor's parents is was a cape um this is relating to what you were talking about with regent and his parents it seems like over and over again in the story we've been reminded again and again that um these powers seem to be hereditary and if you have a uh, a sibling or a parent that has them then you are more likely to have them yourself um and i think that's supposed to be a hint towards something i'm leaning toward her mom having them at the moment but 
that could change, but my official speculation is going to be that one of them is. So, All right. And then my other one, that this is clearly not going to be the last we'll see of Lung. Um, I'm not, I don't know if, if Bakuda actually survives this attack or not, but um, I think Lung is too interesting of a person and has too much of a, a, a history with Taylor to just throw away this character. Um, and obviously when you have a prison that proudly states your uh, chances of escaping at 0.0000025%. It means that people are definitely going to escape from the prison. <laughs> um, so I, that's, I just think that's going to happen. So, um, right. And the only one we definitely have knocked off after this week is that um, Lisa is actually the boss of the Undersiders. That is not true. We found that out today. So I've updated my spreadsheet to show that. Um, I haven't gotten any proven right. I still haven't done the taylor rachel one i'm waiting until like i want to see taylor say the word rachel is my friend <laughs> and then and then i'll I'll consider it um, okay but i think i'm really confident with that one all right sounds good these are these are good this is very enjoyable all right uh so that wraps up arc six tangle i hope everyone enjoyed our discussion and hearing scott's reactions as always we appreciate your feedback we're always trying to improve so let us know if you have any advice on twitter reddit as a comment on our dailyplanetfilms.com webpage via email or in our facebook group we also have a patreon page patreon.com slash dailyplanetfilms and while you're on patreon don't forget to donate to wildbo because he does this for a living Special thanks to our new patron this week, Simbaro. We really appreciate it. Every single dollar helps us make this a better product for you guys. Uh, and if you're one of those who can't spare any extra cash, we completely understand. Uh, but there are tons of ways to still help us out. If you're listening via iTunes, you could take a minute to rate and review our podcast. That would be helpful. It, it brings us up in the rankings and lets more people see it. Also, if you know any worm fanfics that you could share the podcast with, sorry, worm fanatics that you could share the podcast with, that would be great too. Or maybe you can use this podcast as an excuse to finally get someone to dive into the story. Uh, Scott, where can you be found on the internet? I am on Twitter, uh, at ScottDaily85, that's D-A-L-Y. Also, you can find me, all my writing, this podcast, all the other podcasts we do at DailyPlanetFilms.com. All right. See you guys next time. Bye-bye.